Welcome to this week's episode of the Modern Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Cook. Today's episode is all about landing that dream job. And whether you're actively hunting or passively browsing, or even think you might want to move someday, then today's episode is for you. My guest today is Alexa Schoen. Alexa is the internet's leading confidant for panicking job seekers. She's the founder of Entry Level Boss, an online education company that helps people successfully navigate big career moves, and the author of Entry Level Boss, How to Get Any Job You Want. I had a great time chatting with Alexa, and I hope you take away a useful tip or two from our conversation. Today, we have Alexa Schoen joining us, the author of Entry Level Boss, How to Get Any Job You Want. And the timing of this book feels like it was orchestrated in a brilliant way. So Alexa, we are so excited to have you. Thanks so much for being with us today. I am so very happy to be here. Hello, Rachel. I would love to start by just giving our audience a little bit of a sense of you, kind of what your backstory is, what the inspiration was for you to write this book, and where some of your insights and expertise come from. These days, I can usually spin off a very, uh, I don't know, fancy sounding bio, right? I led major information architecture initiatives at Facebook, and I was a senior design consultant for a lot of up and coming European tech startups. And, and that's where I got kind of the bread and butter of my career started. But the reason that Entry Level Boss exists and the reason that I became a career coach alongside doing all these interesting things in the technology world was because I got an English degree and then I thought I'd be super smart and get a master's in jazz performance. And then I showed up in the real world and I could not get a job to save my life. It wasn't that I was entitled. That wasn't really it. You know, I always try to defend the the college grads and the, you know, not millennials anymore, Gen Z, and say, it's not that. It is that through your entire academic life, you do everything right and you check off the boxes and then you show up and you're like, cool, I got passed that test. I'm ready for the next thing. And then they kind of throw you out of school and you're like, cool, where's my job? And it's not that you think you deserve one. It's just that it didn't occur to you that there wouldn't be one waiting. We were all told that we did the right things, right? We went to college or did extracurriculars or whatever. And that mindset shift that happens between academia and the real world is just this giant gap that no one ever really bothers to fill in, you know, and it's nobody's fault. College professors have been in academia and been in school their entire lives. So they're not exactly well positioned to do it necessarily. Your first boss is usually frustrated at how incompetent you are. And so I struggled through the first several years of my career relatively inelegantly. And then by the time I probably got my career started, I was like, I should write all this down before I forget. Because what I've noticed is so many grownups don't remember just how scary it is to show up on the front doorstep of the real working world and just have no clue how to approach it, how to write an email, how to write a cover letter, anything like that. And the number one best selling book in this space, What Color Is Your Parachute, written by Richard Bowles in the 1970s is still one of the number one best-selling job search books in the world. And I thought it was always a great manual for lots of other people, but probably time for a little bit of an update. And that was where Entry Level Boss was born. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's it's really telling because it is confusing when we're heading into college and we're trying to figure out, is there a right major? Is there something that will guarantee me employment? Do I pick what I'm passionate about or what I think will help make me successful? And what I think I hear you saying is that there are steps that we can take as long as we have the right knowledge to ensure our own success. And it, it doesn't need to be driven by our majors, having been spoken by a, a master's in jazz performance. Is that fair? <laughs> yes. Um, ma yeah. Master's in jazz performance and then wound up leading back end engineers at Facebook and never went back to retrain in computer science or anything like that. I think you are exactly correct. And I think that speaks to a bigger issue, which again, is nobody's fault. It's just this kind of giant schism in society of we are still teaching career growth as if the old economy still existed. And it's interesting to now be in this coronavirus era because this is going to be a whole new version of the economy yet again. But when I was originally pitching Entry Level Boss and writing the original book proposal, I was like, I appreciate that there are a lot of people out there who have great advice for, you know, this class of recent graduates or whatever. 
But if you didn't look for a job after the recession, and I graduated from college in 2011, and so in many ways I was lucky, and I kind of got just like the tail end of the recession and sort of back into the upswing of getting out of it. But if you didn't go through that, you really don't understand the trauma of every single entry-level job requiring one to three years worth of experience. And how are you going to get that experience? And, you know, what should I do with my history degree? Uh, And so I think you're exactly right in saying it's not necessarily just about the degree, but it's also about kind of the way that the entire ecosystem has changed, I think. And it does sound like you did happen to graduate in a moment that really prepared you for the moment we're all in. And we are recording this podcast in the middle of April, which at least here in the US means we are not far off of a whole new batch of college seniors graduating. And realistically, we're probably looking at people who have graduated even in recent years who are also struggling to figure out how to stand out and how to really determine a path forward for themselves. You know, I'd love it if you could share just a couple of the insights you had and what what did you learn from your experience job searching when you were still pretty young and fresh in a tough economy? What are some of the things you think you did right? And maybe what are one or two mistakes you learned from along the way? So I'll start with the mistakes, (laughs) because I was just ranting about this to somebody else yesterday, which was I... The number one mistake I definitely always made when I was coming straight out of school was that I wanted to go around telling everyone that I was a recent graduate who was looking for exciting opportunities to continue learning and that would like challenge me to like have, make new skills. And that sounds great when you're 22 and you're just graduating because you've been taught your entire life that like learning is something that's like good to talk about. Like you want to keep learning and that's great. But the thing is that companies don't hire you to learn. They hire you because you're either going to save somebody some time or make somebody some money. You kind of tend to fall flat on your face because you're like, I have this degree. Is this degree valuable? And employers are like, no, why are you wasting my time? And the secret to kind of shift into your second question is to be able to reframe any experience that you have, whether that's internships or leadership activities or volunteering at your church, and it doesn't have to be an official internship, any sort of tools that you have in your tool belt and say, here's how this is going to be valuable to you and your company. Here's how I'm going to provide value on day one. It's something that I'm really passionate about teaching people to do at, at any single level in a company. I think that you know whether you're a senior level person or the intern, if you know how you can help a company stay in business, especially during a recession, that's a really, really compelling and amazing part of being an employee. And the way that I learned this myself actually was because I couldn't get a full-time job. And so I started freelancing. And so I actually built most of my career and became extremely senior very, very quickly. Within my first four or five years out of graduation, I was already consulting C-level executives for some of the biggest billion-dollar technology companies in Europe. And the reason that I got that senior mindset so quickly was because I had to constantly pitch myself as a product in order to just go in and sell that every single day, right? So I was a copywriter. Of course, I was. Now I'm an author. But I had to go in and say, I do copywriting. I do it so that I can help your marketing department sell more stuff. And that's the way that you learn how to pitch yourself when you're a consultant. And I think that more people would do well to pitch themselves that way on their resume or think about themselves that way in order to get the jobs that they want more quickly. I love that. So what I hear you saying is that whether or not you're looking for a job in sales, we all have an accountability to be a salesperson for ourselves and we are the product. Absolutely. And I think that can sound a little bit sleazy the first time you think about it. And I mean, look, I don't want to be a salesperson either. I I'm scared to death of the idea of like having to go out there and meet a quota or something. But I think more so it's I I think of it as an empowerment mindset, really, which is So many people are kind of flailing around being like, it's just not fair that my boss did this or I don't understand why the company would treat me this way. And if you understand exactly like why your job exists, you know, to the most senior people in the company, right? Because again, your job either exists because you're going to help the company sell units and make money or it exists because you're going to make the product better or it exists because you're helping somebody else's life be easier so that they can focus on more strategic stuff or whatever figuring out how kind of all the cogs work together, it's it's tricky and it takes a little while. I think it takes all of us growing into more professional senior versions of ourselves. But I think that that's what the companies of the future are really going to look like because the hierarchy and the traditional career ladder is kind of gone. And so instead, you have this amazing opportunity to sort of join a 
you know, to use a super like hippie term, like a tribe, right? Like every company is kind of this tribe of people who are trying to figure something out. And so if you can figure out how you can help your tribe be successful, that's amazing. So what companies are looking for is not to hear what you're excited to learn or what you're excited to take away from the opportunity, but rather how you can contribute to furthering the company's goals. So if we think about that idea of you are selling yourself as a product that this company needs to buy, and we think about your resume or maybe your cover letter as your one page sales sheet, what are some things that people should be thinking about? What are some things you've seen people do really well that help their resume stand out? And what are some of maybe the old beliefs about resumes that it might be time to retire? The the oldest belief in the book, and this is where my ex-copywriter habits are really showing, is, oh my gosh, it's not like there's some version of some recruiter out there who was born speaking like native professional resume English. (laughs) And, and, And that is their one true mother tongue. And I think that we all have been taught to write resumes in this very serious really like uh, practically in English that doesn't exist anymore, right? From the kind of early 1900s almost. And we all sound like, I think in the book, I say old timey vampires, right? (laughs) It's like, why are you talking like that? That sounds bizarre. If you can't understand what you're saying, nobody else is going to be able to read into it either. And I think you're exactly right about a sales pitch, right? Like great sales copy, you know, the Nike slogan, right? Just do it. Like, it's just simple, short words that somebody's lizard brain can understand. And, you know, within five seconds, they're like, okay, I get who this person is. So I think writing your resume in much more simple English than you're probably used to. And it might almost sound a little bit casual, but what it really is, is you're just writing in clear sentences. I think that's huge. And I think the other thing is in entry level boss land, we call it the nice to meet you section. In old school resume terms, you'd call it that objective section right at the top, like ambitious professional who's seeking new opportunities. But ambitious professional who's seeking new opportunities doesn't actually mean anything. What I would prefer that you say is whatever is basically going to kind of tee up your resume. Like if this one page PDF gets separated from your cover letter and somebody forwards it on to their hiring manager or whatever, you have to be able to provide context on that one sheet to say, hey, like, I'm looking for a junior marketing role in Los Angeles. This is what I'm great at, you know, and here's why I want to come work for this kind of company. You know, it doesn't have to be a full cover letter, but like something that's going to help people understand your work history because they can't create a narrative that you haven't really directed them towards. So one of the things that I love about your book is pretty early on, you have a section about the 14 incorrect beliefs that a lot of us hold when it comes to job searching and resume development. I'm curious, as we think about this moment in time, are there any of those 14 beliefs, and we certainly don't have to run through them one by one, but are there any that stand out to you in this moment of uncertainty and chaos? Are there any that stand out as just either the most important or are there any you would add to this list in the current moment? Oh, man, I think, I mean, the the first thing that I would add is, and I kind of hint at it in a couple of those beliefs, just this concept that in a recession, nobody's hiring, forget it, there's no jobs right now, which I think is, we understand, of course, why, you know, that belief is out there. And this is just so wildly different than any other economic recession we've ever seen before, of course, where we don't quite know what's going to happen yet and all of those good things. But in a recession, any recession, even the Great Depression, the majority of the economy is still employed. And so I think that just this concept of nobody's hiring, so you might as well give up is, you know, really harmful, especially to people who are junior in their career, who layoffs and dealing with your mortgage payments and all that, that that's a major struggle. And I respect that. And that's not necessarily my zone of expertise. But at the beginning of your career, it's not like you can just wait to get started and you shouldn't be waiting to get started. And so even in a recession, there are a whole bunch of companies that are hiring. And I think that the other incorrect belief that really comes to mind out of those 14 is sort of tied to that, which is when we think nobody's hiring and we think that times are tough, we get desperate. And so the incorrect belief from the book, I think it's number one, is that it's the idea that you should cast your net as wide as possible so that you don't miss an opportunity. And that one's always been one of my favorites because it makes sense, right? Like you you want to kind of go out there and say, I'll take any job, absolutely any job, I'm willing to work hard. But if you say something like that to the, I don't know, just uh, masses, 
Nobody has any clue what your skills are or what kind of job you're looking for or where you're looking to get hired. And so even in a recession, even when quote unquote, nobody's hiring, you still have to get specific or specific enough that somebody can say, oh yeah, like you said, you're looking for a junior social media job in LA. Like, oh, I don't know anyone hiring in LA, but my friend in San Francisco just posted a job. Like you got to give people those hooks that they can latch onto in order to help you. And that's true of, of really any part of your career at any part of your life. So what I hear you saying is, yeah, it may seem like a hopeless moment, but there are opportunities out there to be capitalized on. So don't let that hold you back. What if you are right now a person who who believes that? And so you have been putting yourself out there, but you're finding you're not getting bites on your resume or you're really maybe you've been laid off and now you're unemployed and, and you're struggling with kind of the mindset and the emotion that comes with that. As a career coach, in addition to your being an author, what are some pieces of advice that you offered in your book or that you're offering in your coaching practice to people who are just, they're kind of feeling beaten down and they're kind of feeling hopeless? How do you help them build that back up? First thing that you need to do is just breathe and realize that you are probably not the one unhirable person on the planet. Everybody is kind of changing their mindset and situation right now and having to pivot fast. And so in the job search, I see a lot of people try to really take shame and stress driven action. Like they just want to go apply to every single job on LinkedIn. And instead, what I would encourage people to do is take a step back and be like, okay, like, when am I going to run out of money? Like, what is my actual timeline here? What is my real goal? What am I trying to accomplish that's a little bit more specific than, oh my gosh, I need to get a job. It's so embarrassing that I'm unemployed and come up with just a structure for yourself. And inside of the Entry Level Boss book, you know, I wrote it as a manual. I like to describe my nine-step methodology as a fitness plan for getting hired because it is this kind of giant, you know, project management problem to figure out, you know, which resumes to send out and all those things. And and so the best thing that you can do is breathe and, and get yourself organized. That's great advice. And that's actually part of what I loved about your book. It's that when you are graduating in any moment, but especially in a challenging economy, the idea of putting yourself out there can feel so overwhelming. There are so many different components between building your resume and researching companies and going out and networking. And sometimes we can find ourselves being a little bit paralyzed by not knowing where to start. And so having this really clear process laid out for us, and it can help us kind of set goals on a daily basis. And the goal doesn't have to just be get amazing job. There are lots of incremental goals that we can set along the way. And so having that structure and that rigor to help guide us through, I think feels really inspiring right now. I always like to say that one of the biggest frustrations about the job search is it just feels like you are failing every single moment until you get the offer. And that sucks because you have no idea, especially because people rarely give feedback on your resume or if you didn't get the job, you're just kind of flying blind the entire time. And so you're exactly right. You've really got to kind of break it down into like small moments. And and that's what the book is for. Absolutely is helping people to just come up with a little game plan for how they're going to get this done without hyperventilating under their sofa. (laughs) Because I I did that for years and it it didn't work out very well. (laughs) That didn't work, huh? Surprising. (laughs) Shocking, in fact. So I'd love to ask just a little bit, because I feel like what we're starting to get into is a conversation about expectations, right? If we have Mm -hmm. the expectation that, all right, well, I have my degree, so now I will just put myself out there and receive a job. That's obviously not realistic in any economy and and maybe less so in this moment in time. Do you have any advice for people around how to set expectations that are both high enough to be inspiring, but sort of moderated enough so that we're not going to feel so much like a failure? We all have been taught that you sort of get educated and it's so special and wonderful that you got educated. And then even if we were real self-starters in college or, you know, we're always coming up with new ideas and thinking strategically, for some reason, we forget to keep educating ourselves and learning new skills once we get into job search mode. And sometimes that's true even at, at various different, you know, points in your career. But I think there's this, you know, real key sort of magic sauce. And it's a step two inside the Entry Level Boss book, which I call hacking your own skill set. And it's just this idea of figuring out okay, I have a degree, like the degree itself doesn't seem to be exchangeable for a job. Interesting. Didn't see that coming. 
So, you know, like, what are all these job postings saying, for example, and instead of me saying, oh, this isn't fair, how am I going to get one year's worth of experience, coming at it from a really creative angle and like, use all your strategic thinking skills that you just practiced for the last 21 years of your life, and say, okay, like, how am I going to solve this problem? They seem to need somebody who can do this kind of task. Can I Google my way around learning that thing? Like, how could I then prove to an employer that I know how to do this skill? Could I go practice it by, I don't know, doing the accounting for the church bake sale or any way that you could think to identify a skill, just a singular baby little thing. I'm not talking about like learn coding because that's giant and and crazy and ambitious and go for it if you want. I'm talking about like managing a budget inside a spreadsheet, like things that, that businesses have to do all day long, right? And how could you go and practice it? Because I think that so many times where people really get stuck is just assuming that if they don't have any experience, it's out of their control. When we live in a world where you could learn anything you want on YouTube at any given time. And yeah, that's, it's as good a way as any to pass the time while you're waiting for people to get back to your, your application. That is such a great insight. And you made the reference earlier to there's the fitness sort of aspect that you like in this too. There's the romance aspect. And and I've always, <laughs> for some reason, the metaphor that's always worked for me has been in the realm of kind of diet and weight loss, right? And I've heard people say things like, oh, I have all this weight to lose. It's going to take me two years. That seems so exhausting. And then I've heard people say in response, well, two years are going to pass anyway. So you might as yeah. well be taking the steps towards your goal, right? And so what I hear you saying is, listen, if you're currently unemployed, you're not making money either way. So how can you be crafty and creative in how you use that time? You can use it to send yourself deeper into a shame spiral, or you can use it to find a way to build your skills, which I think is a much more inspiring way to think about it. And I love how you framed it. And this is a big mindset shift, but you framed it as an opportunity to be a creative problem solver versus yeah. a victim of a challenging economy. And I think, I don't know, that that kind of sends my energy up a little bit. And I hope listeners take some comfort in that framing. Yeah, I, I think it's equal parts overwhelming and exciting, but I've always been a glass half full person. And if you can just reframe it, you're exactly right. As a problem to solve, you're going out there swinging for the stars and you want the big strategic job and, you know, they should be giving you more responsibility. Okay. Well, take more responsibility for yourself first. Like, and let's figure out how to hack the system, not by lying about having the skills, you know, when they're going to find you out in the first interview, but instead figuring out just like little ways to go make yourself better. You're exactly right. Like what just little baby thing could you chip at once a week, once a day? Because you should not just be spending 13 hours a day strapped into your office uh, staring at your laptop. You're going to get to the interview three months from now and they're going to be like, cool, what have you been up to? And you're going to be like, I've been sitting here in the dark waiting for your phone call. Like that's that's not going to be a way to make a good first impression. So Alexa, it has been so fun to to get here and to pick your brain. So let me just ask, what is the one or two kind of last pieces of advice you want to make sure get out there? Maybe I didn't ask you the question to unlock it, but what piece of advice do you want to leave our listeners with today? I think we covered so much great stuff today, but I think that I would wrap it all up. I'll give you that, you know, a little conclusion a takeaway, which is think about how you can reframe your skill set into how you're actually being helpful to the business, right? I do marketing so that you can sell more books. Great. Okay. And then the other thing is, how can you pick even one or two little baby skills, whether you're unemployed right now or whether you're just starting your career or whether you just got laid off? Was there some software that you were always kind of avoiding that you knew that you needed to learn? Is there some knowledge about how the CARES Act works or, you know, how unemployment benefits work that would be interesting to an employer? Like there's something in your specialty and it's not some tiny giant thing where you have to repivot and pick a whole new career path but there's some little thing that's going to make you a more compelling version of yourself. Pick that and just start Googling and getting interested in it so that you can kind of teach yourself on the fly. Thank you so much, Alexa, for the time and the wisdom and the insight. I have no doubt people are going to take some comfort and some inspiration. Everybody should go out and buy Entry Level Boss. Thanks again so much for your time. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'll talk to you later. Take care. I'm Rachel Cook, your Modern Mentor host. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Alexa, but if you have a question we didn't get to, shoot it my way. 
check out the links in my bio for all the ways you can reach me. And you can visit my website at leadabovenoise.com. Thank you so much for listening and have a successful week.